Welcome to episode 13 of Rail Talk. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm an ownership advisor at West Point Thoroughbreds, and it's been a week full of milestones. We, obviously, John, congratulations on Carly and Rob's wedding this weekend. It was also the love of my life, Megan's birthday yesterday. Today is Anthony LaRocca, our ace associate producer and editor's birthday. So happy birthday, Ant. And also, we reached our three-month anniversary of the show, and that's just flown by for me, John. I can't believe it. I mean, you know, three months, it's been a lot of fun. We've put out a lot of good tape and, and hidden a lot of bad tape. So I think it's a, it's a win-win across the board. That's what those editors do. Happy birthday, Ant. Welcome to another episode of Rail Talk. Please like this video and subscribe to our channel as we strive to keep bringing you honest, consistent, and transparent industry content. We're in the midst of a really strong sales season for Facing Tipton. Obviously, we saw the strong results from the summer up at Saratoga. We've got the October yearling sale coming up in just a couple of weeks. And we've got the Facing Tipton November sale, originally with 246 entries, but there's been six supplements added to that sale. So now we have 252 hips at the Night of the Stars. Really, a couple of really nice supplements, as well as Nickname, who we remember being a grade one winner at, as a two-year-old. And yeah, she was a, a versatile sort. And she's got offspring by Galileo, Wooten. Bassett, just carrying a foal by Uncle Mo. So I think that that of the supplements is the one that really stands out to me. It's going to be a great sale top to bottom. We all know that. And we're all looking forward to that just a couple of days after the Breeders' Cup. But also the Facebook October digital sale just wrapped up. It's actually bidding closes today. And I happen to know the guy who sold the topper, not just the topper, but the record setting topper for the digital sale. John, tell us more. Yeah, Joe, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, we had a great sale. Um, and we had a great sale personally, and Fasig had a great sale overall. Uh, not only did they break through some glass ceilings, but they sold horses for $230,000, $115,000, and $100,000. Um, so if you have the right kind of horse, especially a ready-made horse uh, that people can buy and immediately start running, um, people, they are going to pay through the roof for it. And, and we've been fortunate enough to take advantage of it. Um, but Joe, the other thing that, that's really cool about these online sales, I don't think people realize is that you don't have to upset the horse's training at all. So like we ended up buying a horse back and in previous years, we would have had to send that horse to Kentucky. It would be out of training for a couple of weeks. It would come back. It would take a couple of weeks to get going. It would be like six to eight weeks before you could run a horse. Now, this horse we RNA'd, we're entering and it's going to run on Saturday. So even the ones that we didn't sell are still able to go forward and, and continue to race. And uh, I just love this format. I love the uh, digital platform. And, uh, you know, I think it gives the buyers and the sellers everything they want in an expedient way. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think that that's more and more going to be the future of horse auctions. But there also are some still, still some great in-person sales, none better and the basic tip to November sale, which will be November 7th. You can check out the catalog for that online now at basictipton.com. So we're going to react to a little bit of news made by Mike Rapoli this week, because Mike Rapoli is the kind of guy that when he opens his mouth, people listen and his opinions and his comments lead shows like these, because this time, like he, he went, you know, to 10 in terms of his criticism and his ideas for the sport. And he, you know, he, he's, he called basically for a national owners association that would take back the game as he put it. And, you know, he said he started, he's, he's had conversations with owners and trainers. Uh, he said this on the Nick Luck, on, with Nick Luck on the Spinster broadcast on Sunday. Um, he's also been tweeting a lot about this stuff. And I'll just, I'll just do like a little, little bit of a quote here before we get into it for real. Um, he says his frustration level, he's, he's like, this year, even though our success has been amazing, there isn't anything in the sport that's good right now. We need to make this sport better. So I want to start an association with the biggest owners and the biggest trainers. I think it's our responsibility. People People say, whose fault is it? Why is racing this bad? I blame myself. I blame the owners. First of all, what what is he talking about in terms of racing being this bad? Like that to me is is the issue. And I want to toss to John on this because I know there are a lot of things that get owner get under owners' skin in this game. And I'm not, you know, by all at, 
by any means minimizing the impact that owners have on this business. But you got to be more specific when you're talking about a takeover of the game, especially by the biggest owners and the biggest trainers, as he said. Like, I think this is a sport that needs more decentralization and where it's easier for the little guy to make it. And when you talk about doing associations with the most powerful people in the business to begin with, then I, I, I question that a little bit. But I want to know, I want to hear from John because. You know, what, what What did you agree with? What did you feel in your bones was right about what Mike was saying? And, and what, what, where do you think maybe he's off base? Yeah, I, I think that that overall the idea of having an owner's association is interesting. Um, certainly to, to band together owners and trainers and um, movers and shakers in the industry and to try to make it better. I think that's a great and noble idea. I genuinely do. Um I don't know any of the details so far. I don't think rapoli has been um, outwardly giving, uh, disseminating any of the details. Like, um, how are we going to pay for this? Uh, but, but you know, that, that's that's always you know we talked about that a lot with pre Heisa. Like, how is it going to get paid for? Things like that. Um, I, I'm sure that that's that's going to be addressed at at some point. But um, you know, I just can't I can't see how bringing a group together and if they if the racing industry doesn't adhere to the demands that this new group is put, promoting, um, that they're not going to enter horses. OK, it just it, I don't see that happening um, because there's there's it, to me, there's like two groups of owners. Um, there's a there's a group of owners that have a shit ton of money and like like Mike Rapoli, and they can probably afford to not have their horses run for months at a time. And still be okay. It's not going to change their lives. But most of them are in this business for the ego, you know, for the ego stroke. They're in it to hold the trophy. They're in it to walk the horse into the paddock. They're in it to be seen bidding on a horse. So if they're not given the opportunities to do those things, they're going to get bored awful quick. And then you have the group of owners and trainers that don't have the money, don't have the wherewithal to handle a strike. And they're not going to last very long because they don't have deep pockets at all. They're struggling as it is. So for them to adhere to the idea of they're not going to enter horses, that's not going to last very long, especially because they're going to look at it and say, Rapoli and all these top owners aren't entering horses. This is our time to score. Let's let's double down and enter as many horses as we can. So I, I don't I don't like the idea of threatening an industry um, with the it's my ball. I'm going to take and if you don't do what I want, I'm going to take it and go home. Um, I, I don't think that's a good way to to negotiate. Uh, you know, in, in, especially with with an industry wide situation. And and Joe, the third thing is I, I would love to see itemized declarations of what exactly this is going to be like. What exactly does Mike want or, or this group want? What, do they want to have unified testing? Do they want to have you know, I know they talked about, well, they wanted to have licensing for. Uh, you know, for for auctioneers and for consigners and for agents. And and that's that's all well and good. But who's going to police that? Who's going to administer that? Um, how, you know, what are the standards going to be, uh, you know, for it? I love the idea of, of holding them accountable when they are trying to screw somebody. Believe me, I do. Um, but I, I just don't. It, it's too much. It, it's too much in the ether as far as like what exactly. Right we're talking about. So I, I can't get against or behind it yet because there's just not enough. There's just a lot of smoke. There's not enough information so far. Um, but doing it under the guise of um, if we don't get what we want, we're striking. I, that, that doesn't, that doesn't bode well in my, in my estimation. I mean, the problem for me is like you said, like kind of not, not necessarily how vague it is because he did go back and tweet like a bunch of stuff with like specific ideas, which, you know, I'll read a couple to you. It's, Working with Heiser to improve horse safety, safety with an advisory committee of the most experienced thoroughbred vets with the number one goal to protect horses, uh, working with tracks on having three surfaces if possible, turf, dirt, synthetic, which uh, I think are great. I think are great things, Joe. I, I think right. you would agree with me. I, Sorry, no, go ahead. I, I didn't mean to interrupt. You. I'm saying. There's, a, there's a lot of there's a lot of good ideas yeah. in this. Like, I'll keep going. Like, uh, you know, he says having it make sense for owners and trainers to bring back older horses, which I think is a huge deal, too. 
Like the the purse money for older horses, and this this a lot of this stemmed from the idea that the Derby purse is too small. Which I you know I'm, I've been convinced by by the arguments that people have made that you know the Derby you know it's a huge huge cash cow and not enough goes back to the people who are putting the horses in the race and paying all the fees to begin with. So I'm with y'all on that. Um, mm-hmm. But you know that's another thing is like the purse levels have to be better as the horses get older too. So there's at least some kind of competition between the racetrack and the stallion shed because right now there's none whatsoever and right he says have every, every consignment owner bloodstock agent jockey agent veterinarian license with john mentioned as well fix the two-year-old sales horses will be tested when entered weeks prior to the breeze tested post breeze will also ban one furlong nine and three-fifths breezes suggest they work uh three furlongs or just gallop only before the auction which is also which is by the way something kip elser tried to do yeah at at the OBS yep. spring sale. And he said, yep. I, he, he said, I don't like the fact that we're drilling, drilling these horses so right. fast, so young. I'm going to bring horses and just gallop them. And obviously right. that did not catch on, but that's and, kind and of Frank Strunick did it. Frank Strunick did an entire gallop up sale. I don't know if you remember that, Joe, in, no. in, the, in the late nineties, they did an entire gallop up um, for their homebreds. I think they had like 150 homebreds and they were go sappers and awesome agains and, you know, and, and red bloods. Like they were very well-bred horses. And you would go and you actually sat on haste on hay bales and bid on the horses. Um, wow. And unfortunately, that was a huge flop. Like nobody, Damn. none of the horses really sold very well um, because the industry just wasn't ready for it. I'm sorry. I keep interrupting you, buddy. I'm sorry. No, no. It's like that's I didn't know that that happened. That sounds like a bluegrass fever dream right there sitting on hay bales, <laughs> bidding on galloping horses. So that's no, I mean, that's interesting. So I, I think that there's a lot of a lot of good ideas here. And I, I, I'm glad that he got specific after his initial outburst to Nick Luck because he's obviously a brilliant guy and obviously a very high energy guy who I think, you know, he wants to do the right thing for racing. And it's, I think it's important to have voices like his putting forward these ideas. Like he's one of the most powerful voices in the business. My only issue is like a lot of this stuff is already in motion Mm -hmm. with Heisa and, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the, a lot of the, the industry getting behind these safety reforms and yeah, probably not happening quite as fast as we want them to happen. But I Mm -hmm. think when you say things like there's nothing good about the sport, it's such an embarrassment. Like I'm going to leave. Like I, I, I think you come at it from the wrong perspective. I think you come at it from a much more personally injured perspective as opposed to being able to look outside of your viewpoint and your immediate sphere and figure out what, how do people feel about racing as a whole, you know, because I, I think there are so many good ideas in what he said, but I think a lot of it is redundant with, from what's already being done. And I think the positive purpose of this is to add his voice to that conversation and push the ball forward because he does have that momentum and he does have that power. But I just, the initial the initial reaction to like how bad everything is like I just I, we don't need that energy right now. But if you can channel it into pushing forward positive change, Mike, I'm with you, man, all the way. Yep. And, and, and Joe, let me just let me just jump on one other thing because I I, I disagree with you on on, on one point, um, and I'm in, I'm in the minority on this, um, and that is with regard to the purses for the Derby and the Oaks. Um, I understand that yes, from a economic standpoint, those purses should be higher because the entry fees alone um, basically cover the majority of of those respective purses. Um, That being said, there's no reason for the industry to change that. There's no reason for Churchill Downs to change that because they don't have to. Um, And the reason being is because other than the Breeders' Cup, and you can argue maybe even that that the Derby and the Oaks are more important than the Breeders' Cup. Um, But other than the Breeders' Cup, the Derby and the Oaks are the races that everybody shoots for. That's exactly what the end. So they don't need to, um, you know, promote that anymore by saying we're going to make it a $10 million race. Would it be great if they did? Yeah, but they're not going to get more than 20 entries in the race anyway. They can't. But if they wanted to take that same money and said, we're going to do, X, Y, Z, or if you win these other two races, not including the Kentucky Derby, you get additional monies or we, you know, shore up the idea of grade ones really being legitimate grade ones and not like watered down four horse bullshit fields like like we have in some of these races, um, then the Derby and the Oaks would they would lose a little bit of luster. It would come back to the pack a little bit, Um, but there's no reason. And I would I'd love having you know, seven, eight figure purses. But there's no reason in my estimation why Churchill Downs as a corporation would ever need, would ever want to do that. They don't have to. 
they don't have to. The Preakness might have to. The Belmont might have to. But the Kentucky Derby and the Oaks, they could lower the purses and they would still get 20 something horses entered into, into uh, the Derby, you know, and, and 15 into the Oaks, respectively. Yeah, I mean, it's like clearly Churchill Downs is going to do what's in the best interest of their bottom line. Like that's the one thing other than the Kentucky Derby. That's the one thing that they're known for the most. And obviously, like there probably have been people lobbying behind the scenes for this for a while. And the fact that they had to take it public tells you that Churchill Downs doesn't give a shit. They're going to keep the purse right. as it is as long as they possibly can. But, you know, he he did mention something else about the Derby, which is he thinks 20 horses is, is an unsafe uh, amount of horses to have in the Derby. And he's not the first person to have mm-hmm. said that either. Like a lot of people have made that case. I'm curious, how, how, how do you feel, John? Well, I, I'm, I'm fine with reducing the, the number of horses in, in the Derby. So it's not just a, a cattle charge, you know, like a cavalry charge, like, like it is right now, but like anything else, you know, when things are successful, they're going to continue to, to elongate it. Um, you look at the NCAA basketball tournament and, you know, they originally had, but they have 32 teams and they went to 64, then they went to 66 and they went to, you know, 70. And, and, you know, if, if people like it, if, if some is good, then, then, you know, more is great. Um, and I think they they do that, you know, with a lot of the playoffs, baseball increased the number of teams in the playoffs. Um, football obviously did basketball. Mm-hmm. I mean, all, all of them are, are expanding um, the playoff opportunities because that's what the, People want people want to have and people in the industry I'm talking about want to have 20 horses in the, in the in the Kentucky Derby because that's 20 families that could be positively impact as opposed to 15. If you leave it at 15 have 15, you know, families like it. So they need to have that dream. And if you're going to have, you know, 20 out of 20,000 falls. I'm rounding, um, you know, run it. You have a one in 1000 chance. If, if all of a sudden it's down to 12 horses or 14 horses, then the numbers really stack against you. And if it's going to be like a 15 horse field, Joe, I would hate to be number 16 because you'd be like, screw it. In other years, I would have been, you know, I would have been uh, in the Derby and would have had a chance. And of late, there have been a lot of long shots that have, that have hit the board and, and, and have won the Derby. I mean, it's also like the, the European races every single day, Australian races oh, yeah. every single day with 20 plus yeah. horses in the race. Like that's just, right. you know, it's, it's just something that's that's kind of standard in the rest of the world. It's only an anomaly here. So I'm right. kind of ambivalent about that. Uh, yeah. But the other thing I, I just wanted to bring up one more time is the, the having purses be better for older horses, because then, as he was saying, like, not only do you have horses stick around and potentially garner more fan interest over time. But then also potentially you have a strengthened breed because you, because you have hardier stallions going to the shed that have raced 15, 20, 25 times over several seasons. So I think that that makes a lot of sense, too. But again, like how feasible is that, John? Like Churchill Downs doesn't want to raise the purses. Like how who's going to step in, especially right. now that like Frank Stronach is unfortunately, I think, probably on the way out in terms of influence, at least. And. Yep. He, you know, he's the only guy I could think of. Like he tried to do that with the Pegasus. I mean, who else is going to step up and boost purses for older horses? Right. And, and, and Joe, if you think about it, like a lot of these horses that are retiring, they're retiring because they're getting 10, 20, $50 million. So how, how much can you increase the purses to guarantee in essence, you know, those owners, that kind of money? It, it's, it's just the, the, the numbers really skewed from racing to breeding. Or, or breeding over racing, I should say, um, really goes back to when when Vinery Farm, when Ben Walden, Elliot's brother, and he was running um, Vinery, and he figured out that instead of having just forty shares for a horse, you could increase it to fifty shares for a horse, and instead of only breeding eighty mares to a horse uh, in any given year, you could really increase it to one hundred and twenty or one hundred and thirty, and then through you know through science. Um, of anticipating when mares are going to be bred and they can kind of pinpoint when they should breed them. Now you're starting to see 200 mare books, 220 mare books. So, so the, 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 you know, the math, the arithmetic expands exponentially, you know, increases exponentially. Now that you have so many more mares that want to be bred to these stallions. So it is going to be nearly impossible in my estimation. And, And you know me, I'm, I'm, I'm very pro the industry, but it's going to be nearly impossible to, um, incentify people to race their horses when there's a 10 or $20 million offer sitting on the table. How many races, Joe, how many races do you have to win to net $10 million? A lot. I mean, you got to win like the Saudi cup or right. you know, 
the yeah. Breeders' Cup and, Classic and stuff. It's hard. Right. And and there's only one horse that can win each of those respectively. I mean, oh, I don't think there's been a horse that or maybe there was. Was there did Arrogate win both? And maybe there was one horse that won that won both. He won um, the Breeders' Cup Classic and the and the Dubai and, World Cup. And the Dubai yeah. World Cup. But but that that's mm-hmm. a real anomaly. That that's kind of one in you yeah. know in the history of the industry. So and look, I know I know you people will say, well, look, John, if it's ten million dollars and the horse wins a couple more races and then you know, doesn't do well the rest of its career um, and they retire it, you know, oh, boo-hoo, they get $5 million. Well, that's still, you know, then I, I lost $5 million or I had my horse. <laughs> I mean, that's horse real money. Life. Yeah, that's my real horse money, little, even, even yeah. to wealthy people, like that's real right. money. And, yeah. yeah, so so the, 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 the numbers are skewed. Um, and again, now, now I can hear it in the back of my head. Well, that's why the jockey club wanted to have 140 mare cap. That's not why they wanted to have a 40, 140 mare cap. They wanted to have 140 mare cap. Be, they said because of genetics, but anyway, it, it, it all kind of, it all kind of flows into the, the game has, has morphed in my estimation from racing being the primary focus of the industry to breeding being the primary focus of the industry, because it's so much easier, not that it's easy, but it's, it's, it's less difficult, I guess is a better way to say it, to make money breeding than it is to make money racing. Yeah, I mean, and that goes to the, you know, I don't want to go on too long with this, but it's just, and I appreciate Mike for sparking this kind of conversation, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but that kind of goes to the uh, the two-year-old sale concern as well, because the other way you can make money in this business is pin hooking. Like right. that's that's one of the only other ways you can make consistent money and, you know, other than like hitting, hitting it rich with a stallion. And that I think can you know, incentivize people to do shitty things and to crank right. on horses that should not be cranked on, especially at a young age. So that's another thing that that I think I agree with Mike that needs reform as well is is the two year old sales. Right. Um, but there's you know, there's there's so much there's so much meat in what he was talking about. And I, I appreciate that. I just you know, when you're talking about, you know, having a new association like that's what Haiza is like, can we right. just work with them and bring all of your legitimate expertise to that table and, you right. know, kind of all unite around that. Like, you know, it, I just don't want to, I don't want any more splinter groups. You know, we finally got to the point where we have this like unification in this business and it's a, it's a tenuous thing, you know, especially with the lawsuits going on, who the fuck knows if this is going to be a permanent situation for us. But now that we do have it, Can we just, you know, bring all of the expertise and the knowledge that is so vital to that cause? That would be that would be my one pushback. Yeah. And and, and Joe, I think I think it comes down to somebody like Mike Rapoli, who is a brilliant businessman, genuinely a brilliant. I mean, not not only has he has he bitten the apple once, he's done it twice, you know, as far as selling his companies to to public trade companies. I mean, it just astonishing how well he's done guys like that who are tremendous entrepreneurs and are used to being in charge of things like to be in charge of things. And right now with Haiza, he is not going to be in charge of it. So things aren't moving as quickly for him. So he wants to have his own organization to, to do it as opposed to, Hey, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to join forces and try to add my expertise um, to this already existing situation and maybe help fight off some of these lawsuits or maybe help Lisa Lazarus at all, um, you know, do what they need to do to expedite this process. I, I think that would be a better use of of anybody's time and efforts um, because you're right. Otherwise, we're just all kind of like, you know, muddying the waters and 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 nobody's leading again. And we, we've had that for 100 years. Rail Talk is sponsored by TaylorMade Sales. TaylorMade always at the top of the heap when it comes to auction results. They had two of the top three lots at the October to digital sale, which we just mentioned before, both of which were John's, which he so humbly did not mention until we pried it out of him. And then also the facing tip to November sale coming up November 7th. I did the counting. TaylorMade has 46 entries in that sale. And that's like, that's the elite of the elite sales, only 250 entries in total. And of course, that that consignment will be led, at least in our hearts, by Wonder Wheel, the champion for DJ Stable and Mark Cassie. So we're looking forward to seeing her go through the ring. I'm sure she'll get a great round of applause, as they always do at the Night of the Stars. And I'm so excited to see the rest of the Taylor May consignment because you know it's going to be a star-studded consignment of mares and weanlings by top sires. Taylor Maid is the worldwide leader in thoroughbred sales, marketing, and horse care, family owned and operated since 1976. Their honesty and transparency keeps people coming back. 
like our friend John Green here, and they're they're in the position they are for a reason. So good luck to all the TaylorMade team getting through the rest of this sales season. I know it's been a bit really busy for y'all, but obviously the success keeps piling up, and uh, we'll see you at Facing November. I'm so thrilled to welcome this next guest to Rail Talk, especially after a huge weekend of racing at Keeneland. He's a host and reporter for FanDuel TVG. He's also a representative and an auction caller for Keeneland and the Keeneland Paddock host. Scott Hazelton, welcome to the show. Joe and Jonathan, uh, great to be here. Thanks for having me. So stoked to have you. And like you, you really are synonymous with Keeneland. Like I, I always think of you and hear your voice, you know, in, instinctively when I, I'm handicapping the Keeneland races. You know, can you just talk a little bit about what makes Keeneland so successful? Like I know that's a pretty broad question, but it's just it's one of those destination tracks like Saratoga that we don't really have that much of anymore in this country. What are just some of the things that make Keeneland such a destination for people? Well, I, first and foremost, the history of it and, and what it's brought to the game over all of these years. I think that that just from a broad perspective um, and, and also what they do to give back to the game. Um, I was having conversations with Dr. Stuart Brown um, just the other day, actually, before opening day and all the innovation that they've got and in just progressing when it comes to horse safety and, and things of that nature and, you know, investing back into the sport and, you know, with the, you know, the, the money that that is is gathered up from the sales investing it right back into to the racing into the safety aspect to so many different layers of it um from a fan experience perspective i mean there's there's no other fan experience like keeneland to me um at the very least in north america they they're so dialed in so traditional um i think you know when you think of just going to keeneland it's it's one of the few places that still has a dress code right i mean and, and you've got to abide by it and i think that people um, want that to, to a respect, right? I mean, it's, there's very few places left in, in just any bit of society, let alone sport where you've got to abide by that. And, and that's part of it. And that's part of what makes it great. You get dressed up, you go out to the races, you have a great time. The the fan experience is amazing. And you always know that you're going to come across a great racing product. I mean, this weekend is a prime example of that. And that's going to continue for, you know, the, the weekday races that we have in the remainder of the meet and, and obviously the weekends as well. So, you know, there's so many things about it. And then you, you mix the sales in the importance of the sales when it comes to the yearling sales, the November sale, the, the January sale uh, and the April horses of racing age sale. Uh, it's a totally unique experience, too. I mean, I, I would uh, press anybody who's gone to either or both to, to make sure that they go to both, first of all, and say that they didn't have a great experience because they're unique experiences and, and they do a great job on both ends of it. Right. And, and Scott, you have a unique perspective because you do cross over from racing over to the, the sales. And, and I was telling Joe that, you know, I've been to hundreds of sales and, and you don't really notice the auctioneer's banter unless you know somebody up there in the pit or, or your horse is in the ring or something like that. And I remember you and I had a text exchange during the September sale. Um, and I was just fascinated at how well you were doing being uh, what I would call the reader of, of the auctioneers, because I got to think that's the toughest job up there because every 30 to 60 seconds, maybe you're getting a new pedigree. Yeah. And look, I don't know how the auctioneers do what they do. I, I, you, I think you could, it, there, there is few things in the world and professions that I think that I, I could, you could ask me to try to do, and I would, I would be completely lost. What they're keeping track of from the bids coming from not just in front of them, but behind them, now on the phone, on the internet, all the things that they've got to keep track of, and they do it so smoothly and seamlessly, and and the way in which they count and keep track of it, and the whole system in which it should, in which it works. Um, I mean, we're we're a small part of that, obviously, a, a part of it, no question about it introducing those horses and the pedigrees, but you know, I, I, I've done it for, I started at the end of 2019. I'll never forget. That's the first time I went up there to try out for them. It was a, I want to say it was a January, it might've been an April sale. And I went up and they gave me about a 20 ish hip two twice in one day rotation to do it. And I went up and it was warm in there and I was nervous. I had not, I don't know that I've ever been that nervous in my entire life going up there. And once I got done, I was so thankful it was over and it was like one of those situations where it was a blur. <laughs> I think the benefit of doing live TV for all the years that I had up until that point and obviously have continued really helped me because, you know, that's, there's chaos in, in live TV. There's somebody talking in your ear, you know, things may not always and don't always go as planned. You got to pivot quickly and all those things. So I think that sort of just being able to think on your toes, uh, 
ability really did help me from the TV side of things into the to the sales announcing. And I, I tell you what, it's it's my favorite thing to do. I love doing live TV. I do. My life has been blessed for, for, in so many fronts, professionally speaking, and the opportunities that that I've had and the places I've gone. But when it comes to being up there and having that that seat, that view being right next to the auctioneers and watching them do their things and, and seeing those amazing horses come in and, and be part of that and the gratitude in which uh, we feel from the consigners and the, and the owners of these horses and things of that nature and having to sometimes, you know, pivot quickly to, you know, make sure that you're on point and things of that nature. There's no bigger rush than that. I, I love it, love it, love it. And that's an understatement truly when it comes to being a, a pedigree announcer there at Keeneland for the sales. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd like to just broaden the scope a little bit because I do think that, you know, being a Keeneland representative and being so immersed in it, it's just it's the best of racing and sales at all times. And we know that that's not necessarily the status quo across the industry throughout the nation. There are, you know, a lot of tracks that are struggling, a lot of states that are struggling. Um, there's been, you know, the rollout of Heiza, which has had its successes and failures. We actually had a tough summer at Saratoga. You know, you cover racing outside of Keeneland. You know, you're on the ground, you're on the front lines with FanDuel TVG. You know, just what's your sense, especially as a younger guy who's going to be one of the standard bearers for the business, at least public facing going forward. How do you feel about racing and the spot that it's in compared to when you got into it? change is always needed in anything. If we're not moving forward and changing and, and adapting and things of that nature, I don't care what business it is, then you're going to get left behind. So first and foremost, there's always room for tinkering or big steps. And I, obviously there's a, that's not, you're not going to take those big le leaps and, and you've got to tinker before you get to those. And there's a buildup, right? But I think that we've got to stop beating ourselves up in the industry. I, I really do. And, and, and and stand proud with what this sport does and and at the ultimate core of it and the more and more that i get a chance to travel and things of any, that nature and and work in the industry what's the one thing that that we look forward to more than anything just from a broad perspective and in my opinion i know i'm answering my own question it's bringing people together there's nothing better than meeting your friends at the track and getting a chance to to spend a day with them and, and go out afterwards and things of that nature and and just think of all the friends that we've made and the connections we've made at the racetrack and all the the people that have been helped through the in, through the industry it's it's i i one time got upset somebody called it an exclusive industry i've never been in a group of, and a circle of of people and uh, places that are more inclusive i've never seen anybody turned away from the racetrack. You can get a racetrack on the backside, regardless of what happened or what may have happened that would be keeping you from getting a, a job at the racetrack. It, it may not be the flashiest job. You'll come out and walk hots for a bit, but you prove your, yourself and you work hard and things of that nature. There's going to be a spot for you. So I think that that's, to me, one of the things that we have to consistently remind ourselves of and remind people of that we're doing a damn good job of taking care of these horses. They're well taken care of. Their strides have been made when it comes to safety. If you look at the numbers, if you look at the overall just last five, 10 years of it, uh, the strides that are being made at places like Keeneland, which other racetracks look up to and look towards, and they are ready and willing all the time to go and lend their opinions and, and what they're utilizing and techniques that they're using at, at various tracks around the world. And obviously, Make sure that that we're well aware of where we as an industry are aware of that, first of all, and make sure everybody else is aware of it as well and what this industry does. And it brings people together, it brings people together on all levels and just not just coming together to the track to get pals together and spend an afternoon and smoke cigars and drink some bourbon and beer and have a great time. But the, the rest of it as well, from the ground level up, I mean, that's that to me is why I maintain a positive outlook on the industry because all, through all the things that we encounter and will encounter, let's just face it. That's just how any sport industry is going to go. You're going to encounter adversity in all aspects of life, but you know, we, we just continue to bring people together and whether it through, be through giving them jobs, getting people together and things of that nature, that, that to me is one thing I think we've got to do a better job of, of making sure people realize that. 
And, and Scott, you were, you know, kind of born into the business um, with, with, with the family history and you have a couple of kids. If, if, if one of your daughters came to you and said, I want to be in the horse industry, what sector of the industry would you point them towards? Would it be on air? Would it be training? Would it be pin hooking? Would it be auctioneering? I mean, which, which of those would you? Podcasting. And, and also, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Podcasting. <laughs> and, and, and would your relationship with your dad and, and all of the races that he wanted as a trainer, would that affect you know, your, your, your answer? You know, I don't think I'd point him in any direction because my dad and, and mom never pointed me in a direction. And my dad was always very, he said it up until the day he passed at the end of 2019 that he, you know, he, he never realized that I wanted to be in the industry and was always surprised by it. Cause I always kind of took a, a sort of when I was younger, it, it, there were plenty of times throughout my entire childhood, my entire existence where I didn't necessarily want to be at the track. It would be boring to go out there all the time. There weren't a lot of kids my age, things of, of that. But once I got to hang out with my dad as I got older and hang out with all the guys at the track and realize, you know, these all these men and women that have been in my life are as much family as any people, even to this day, that I've ever come across. So I, I don't necessarily I think I would push them in any one direction. If they would if they want to, great. I will support them one million percent with whatever they want to do. And and that's all that's all I hope for is they find something they're passionate about because um this industry Overall, I, I have as much passion about it as, as anything um, in my life. Uh, obviously, that, that is my passion. It's going to continue to be until uh, my, the end of my days. Yeah. No, I mean, that passion comes across. Like, that's what makes part of what makes you such a great broadcaster is like you can really feel what a fan of racing you, you are. Um, so let's, let's let's have a little fan talk. We got the Breeders' Cup coming up in a little less than a month now. We obviously have the big prep weekend at Keeneland, a lot of great action. You know, just give me an overview. Of what are some of the horses or some of the storylines that you're looking forward to most uh, in about four weeks time at Santa Anita? Well, that's that's a tough one because. Um, it's, it's one of those that I think that f at least for me, it, I try to take my days day by day because of there's so much in between now and then. But I think that looking at, at just this, even this last weekend with so many key prep races in the last two months with so many horses that, that don't have that month out prep, especially it seems more so that, than any, um, as far as the division, it's the distaff or the, excuse me, the classic division. But I mean, the classic division just going big is as wide open as, as I've seen it in some time. I mean, there's, there's not last year was a bit of an outlier and we've had those classic years. American Pharaoh comes to mind flight line last year where you've got a horse that's just so dominant that it, it would take a Herculean effort that nobody had in them to, to do uh, and, and be able to defeat those horses. But I mean, Archangelo is the favorite should be the favorite. However you want to be that bright, bright future. I think that he's got to be 1 million percent, uh, respected just based on his developmental pattern here in the last uh, little bit. Um, I'm, I'm intrigued by White Abario. I'm intrigued by Rick Dutrow. The, I think that he is one of the most interesting guys for a number of reasons, whether you, you know, uh, whatever path you want to take that conversation, just leave it at that. But I think he's a hell of a horseman. I really do. I mean, I really do think he's a hell of a horseman. And, and obviously White Abario is a, a, the most recent example of that. So, um, and just, I know I'm leaving out a few others in, within this division, but I think that any number of the, say the top 10 in the Breeders Cup Classic rankings are by far and away capable of running a big race, a big enough race to, to come away with that win at, at the mile and a quarter distance. And, and what should people expect having the Breeders' Cup out West this year? Um, are there any nuances or anything that, that you would recommend when people come out or when they're, when they're handicapping, uh, you know, the, those kind of races? I mean, speed obviously is, is next level when it comes to, to Santa Anita and on those big days. But we see fast times, you know, even at Keeneland, faster times. It's just fast horses put, put together fast times. And these are the fastest of the horses that we have in the world, especially when it comes to the, to the dirt racing. Um, the hillside turf course makes it a different uh, aspect when it comes to the, to the Breeders' Cup turf at the mile and a half distance. I mean, that's that to me, when you think of Highland Real, the way he was able to win the Breeders' Cup turf at Santa Anita and Little Mike, they, they were propelled by that, literally propelled by it, by starting halfway down the hillside turf course. And also now with the Breeders' Cup turf sprint not being down the hill, I think that really levels the playing field because you look at those past Breeders' Cups at Santa Anita, it was so uh, 
swung in the in the favor of the the West Coast and horses that had run there. That I think that that's the right thing to do is to keep it at that five eighths distance on the flat. But I think that I think that when it comes to these Breeders' Cup races, I think that they're so evenly matched and and the courses in which they run they're so fairly evened out as far as the the setup that uh it's hard to outside of a one turn mile dirt situation or in this instance two turns i think that that's going to be one of the things that's you know and obviously the one turn mile would be at, at churchill whenever we get back there but i think that uh just looking at these divisions especially from the dirt mile to the classic division you know where are these horses are going to end up and, and where are they going to run or the sprint to the to the dirt mile just one quick follow-up before we let you go is, you know, I'm looking forward to getting out there for the Breeders' Cup because the last one was in 2019, and obviously that was a that was a, that was a tricky situation that year with everything that was going on at Santa Anita with the breakdowns. And it just feels like, in general, the industry is in a better place now, four years later, and people are, it's going to be a little bit more of a festive environment. So can you just compare, you know, the feeling going into this year's Breeders' Cup at Santa Anita versus the last one? You know, I, it's, 2019 seems so long ago and I know that there was some transition and and overcoming the track and and it you know they, like I said before they've really I think they've righted the ship there for the various things and it's it's never it's never as easy as one simple as as solving one thing when it comes to anything that we're trying to solve within this industry it's it's a multitude of things and I think that you can see by the numbers that since then they really have have I don't want to say figured it out but up until this point they've improved it so much. Um, but I think that the vibe about Breeders' Cup is everybody's so excited to be there. We're so excited to see all these horses run. We're so excited to see the Europeans come in, the Japanese that come in that have to be respected every single time that they bring horses anywhere in the world now over the last few years in which they've really started to travel and win these big races, whether it's in the Breeders' Cup, Dubai, or, or Saudi Cup night. Um, but you know, I think that the vibe is positive and I, I've never gone into a breeder's cup feeling anything but that truly. And my first breeder's cup was all the way back in 2017 was my first breeder's cup as from a, a journalistic perspective, um, covering it. And I've always felt that way. It's, it's, it's a unique experience and it's just great again, to bring everybody together. It's amazing how much these horses bring people together. Absolutely. And they brought you to this show and we're so glad that you came on. Scott Hazelton, keep up the great work, man. Appreciate you jumping on with us. Hey, thank you, John. Thank you, uh, Joe. I really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun and I'd, I'd love to join you anytime you have time for me. Rail Talk is sponsored, as always, by The Green Group. If you're not using The Green Group to help you with taxes, you're probably paying too much money in taxes. They have over 800 clients in the horse business, as John said last week. They had a booth at the wedding. <laughs> because they think of everything. Um, Lennon is obviously a great guy and a dear friend to all of us. And uh, congratulations to him as well on his granddaughter's marriage. But the Green Group knows two things better than better than most, the horse business and accounting. And that Venn diagram, which I've told you about, they're right on top of each other. And Len will consult with potential clients for free. He's going to review your last returns. If he can't find you more savings, he'll tell you doing great, but he usually finds some savings. And a consultation with Len is always more fun than that. He's a leading voice in entrepreneurship. He taught at the Babson School. He's got a book called The Entrepreneur's Playbook that you should definitely read. And he's owned over 30 successful businesses. Talking to Len is like getting a mini MBA, and you should do it if you haven't. It was a big weekend of racing, as we talked about with Scott, especially at Keeneland. Uh, just a couple of results I wanted to mention before we wrap up the show, because this is kind of this is kind of it now until the Breeders' Cup. We'll get that like three or four three or four week break um, where everyone's just kind of you know trying to batten down the hatches and get to the Breeders' Cup in good health. Um, but a couple of a couple of performances I really liked, you know, especially at Keeneland up to the Marks race in the turf mile. We talked about this before the race that like. You know, I I think the world of up to the mark, but for him off a four month layoff to come back going a mile when I think he's probably better going a little bit further than that and run down Master of the Seas when Master of the Seas got a perfect trip and got the jump on him too. That was like to me that was one of the most ex exciting races of the year. It's an absolutely 
flawless ride by Jose Ortiz, who I think gets overshadowed sometimes by Irad. I think Irad gets so much of the attention that Jose is also top five jockey in the country. That was really, really exciting to see, but still not enough to put Mike Rapoli in a good enough mood <laughs> over the weekend to, you know, to, to avoid all of that outburst. But I'll just, just Josh in there. we got a couple other races I wanted to mention. The British Futurity locked, ran gigantic also for Todd Pletcher and Jose Ortiz. So the horse that had run a big buyer with a huge maiden win, 96 buyer at Saratoga. You wanted to see him back it up. He was drawn outside. He broke slowly, was wide around both turns, came up on a horse that had gotten the dreamest of dream rail trips and wore him down late. I love, love seeing stuff like that. Like not just to have the talent to win a blowout maiden race, but to have the guts to win a, a dog fight like that with a horse who got a much better trip. I think big things to come for locked going forward. Idiomatic proved, I think once and for all, at least for this year that she's a better horse than nest nest doesn't did not quite come back the same as a four-year-old that happens a lot with Phillies, you know, as you see over time, but idiomatic is so good right now. And she's got to be the favorite coming up in the distaff. Just a couple other ones I want to mention before I toss to John real quick, uh, warlike goddess winning the Joe Hirsch turf. I was, I was at, Aqueduct that day, and it was freaking pouring and miserable. But that got me excited to see her beat the boys because she is just so solid. That's a mayor. That's a Philly mayor that did, does not lose her form, no matter how old she gets, no matter how long she keeps racing. So shout out to Warlike Goddess and the connections of her, for her. And how about how about the Nightfall Chatterball horse gutting out to the front by twenty lengths in that race and holding for third at ninety to oh, one? Yeah. Like there was a time on the turn where it seemed like they were not going to catch that horse and they just kind of wore him down late. And I love that. I love being aggressive. Like if I bet that horse, I feel like I got my money's worth rather than right. trying to pull back the horse and save them. Like just go and make them catch you. But Warlike Goddess was great. Timberlake was really good in the champagne. Uh, we ran one too. West Point ran one too on Friday in the Geopani stakes, which was super, super exciting with Northern Invader and Ohana Honor. Two very, very nice three-year-old turf horses of I think we're going to have a lot of fun with going forward. So that was fun. So it was a big weekend. As you can see, I was yeah. excited by a lot of this stuff. But, you know, John, what stood out to you? Well, two, a couple of things uh, stood out to me, Joe. Number one, you mentioned a couple of your three-year-old turf horses. Um, how good are the three-year-old turf group this year, especially compared to, to other years? I mean, if you look at if you actually three-year-olds in general, I shouldn't even just say just limit just the turf. But you look at this three-year-old crop and it is really stout from top to bottom. Phillies, Colts, turf horses. Um, and, and to me, that's like a breath of fresh air because there's a lot of these horses that will continue to run as four year olds um, and, and continue to, to, to move and shake and, and be part of the uh, landscape for the uh, for the 24 season, which I'm very excited to see. Um, shout out to to Aaron Wellman and Eclipse Thoroughbreds. They had a day. Candide won the Alcibiades. And guess what, Joe? She was a physic Tipton graduate. Could have bought her at, at face in July for 165,000. Um, ran a brilliant race in the Alcibiades. Um, they also won with Locked, as you mentioned, who, you know, is another gun runner beast. Another horse that broke the track record, actually, for a mile at Saratoga as a two year old. I mean, that that's that's unheard of. And then came back and and won this race pretty impressively. Um, and Nest, you know, look, it, I know from Wonder Wheel, I know from Jaywalk that sometimes these horses just don't develop um, or don't want to run as much as they did in the, earlier in their career. Um, still a really good second and uh, may not be the same kind of horse, but believe me, you, anyone and their brother would trade any horse for, for Nest at this stage of the game. So Aaron Wellman had a really good weekend and, and I'm very happy for him. He's a friend of the show and, and a good guy. So uh, those things all uh, impressed me. And then I got it. You know, I wouldn't be me, Joe, without the humble brag here of, of can group, but it's not really a humble brag because this schmuck, you know, actually said last week, well, if we were six to five, I'd go to Kentucky instead of my daughter's wedding. And, you know, thankfully, um, you know, I got to go to my daughter's wedding can group one um, at 30 to one, and I didn't get divorced because of it. So I, I guess, I guess it's a win, win, win across the board, but how about another phase of graduate can group, Winning the bourbon, the wind in your in, and uh, and and now we get to go uh, mano a mano against your Carson's run in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf. How much fun is that going to be? Yeah, man, bring it on! Like that—that's—that's that's, going to be great. Congratulations to you guys, and I think that's uh, 
Cash is King, right? Chuck Zachney. Yeah, on that so Chuck well. Zachney is is a part of that, and Chuck, you know, obviously we were partners on on Jaywalk as well. Um, so Chuck and and his son uh, Alex have been great friends and great partners to to us, and uh, couldn't be more excited. And and a shout out to Chuck because you know we went to that Phasic sale and we bought a few horses at that sale, and and I sent them pedigrees and said, you know, look, if you if you want to have a piece of any of these, you certainly can. And and he stepped up and he bought a, a piece of a Maximus Mischief that we had, um, and he bought a piece of of Can group again sight unseen i mean he went strictly on on trust that that we knew what we were doing he looked at some of the videos and uh and and he loved the fact that we were able to get this this you know this athlete um for a hundred thousand dollars at the phasic october sale last year um and and joe you know in hindsight you look back and you say why was this horse 30 to one well he ran third his first two starts albeit one of the horses he lost to was timberlake <laughs> so, you know, so and so it wasn't even like that he ran against, you know, schlubs at at, uh, at Ellis. Timberlake was there and, and and won that race. And then ever since we moved this horse to the turf, uh, you know, he's really taken to it. And, and he won at Kentucky Downs, broke his maiden there. And then, uh, you know, again, won it, it, just by a nose. I mean, just by the dirtiest of noses in the bourbon. Um, but that's that's all they take. It doesn't matter how much you win or lose by. They pay you the same amount. And they pay you to go to the Breeders' Cup. So we'll, we'll, we'll see you there. And, and we're so stoked about that. Uh, just really quick, I wanted to mention a couple other horses just because there was racing on the West Coast this past week. Uh, Muth was impressive. Son of good magic uh, for Bob Baffert and the American Pharaoh. Another gun, another big gun runner winner with Chad Ellis in the, in the chandelier. Also wanted to mention also, uh, Gina Romantico ran down in Italian and Peter Brandt won two in the First Lady. Like that – it's clearly the best race of Gina Romantica's life, life, and obviously Chad is always stacked in that division. So that that was pretty damn impressive. And just one more West Point horse I want to mention before we wrap up because I didn't mention him, Slider, who's going to be one of our starters in the Breeders' Cup. He's going to he's going to run, assuming all systems are going, the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf Sprint. He won the Speakeasy Stakes on Saturday at Santa Anita. And he only got a 76 buyer. He had run in the 80s his first two. But go watch that race because he tried to blow the turn. It was his first time on turf, and he was trying to get out on the turn. And it was a great job by Hector Berrios flashing the whip at him and, like, getting him to stay straight enough that he only turned for home in the middle of the track. Horse came right up the inside, got that dream run on him as Slider drifted out. Slider came back down to the rail and then rebroke and got him again in the last 16th of a mile. He is my favorite two-year-old that we have at West Point. And we got a lot of nice ones. Can't wait to see him at the Breeders' Cup. Go watch the race if you haven't because 99 times out of 100, when a horse blows a turn like that and someone comes up the rail and takes that ground from you, you lose. And he he dug in and won. So that was exciting. Great weekend of racing. This coming weekend, it's basically just the QE2. Uh, it's, that's going to be a stack field at Keeneland. John and, and DJ Stable are going to have Papilio. But other than that, pretty quiet until the Breeders' Cup, which obviously we can't wait for. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Rail Talk. If you like this episode, be sure to hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel to be the first to know when new episodes drop. You'll find weekly episodes, blooper reels, one-on-one interviews, and our Breakaway Rail Talk series. Be sure to leave us a like and a comment below. We love talking to y'all, and who knows, maybe you'll just end up in one of our shows. All right, so that's going to do it for episode 13 of Rail Talk. A very spirited episode, if I do say myself. Shout out to you, John, for always being able to go back and forth with me like this is why we love, love doing the show. Shout out to Mike Rapoli for sparking that conversation. Thanks to Scott Hazleton for stopping by to talk to us uh, about Keeneland and the Breeders' Cup. Always good to, to hear from Scott. Thanks to our producer, Patty Wolf, our associate producers, the birthday boy, Anthony LaRocca, Leah LaRocca, and Nathan Wilkinson. Thanks again to our sponsors and to you, the viewing audience, for tuning us, tuning in to us this week. We'll see you next week on Rail Talk.